Zoolander 2. Yeah, I won't even touch it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I made the mistake. I was like, I'll just give it a shot. Everyone says it's crap, but I'll just do it anyways. Big mistake. Huge mistake. And the worst is when it actually taints the first one. Sure. Just slightly. Because the first Zoolander, for instance, was a satire on, at least to me, it felt like a satire on the fashion industry. Sure, absolutely. Um, some people just look at it as, as just some stupid guys pretending, but I, I think it was a little bit more intelligent than that. And it just had some great performances in there. It was funny as hell. It was so funny. Yeah. The second one, however, was no longer the satire. It was just, let's rehash what we did before. People haven't seen us for a while. We'll do the same jokes to be like, hey, remember us? Yeah, orange mocha frappuccino. Right, you guys said that. Yeah, exactly. You said that. Like, we, we heard you say in the first one, give us something different. And it was one of those movies, same with The Hangover. The first That's Hangover, funny. I adore. Door. It's, it was like the funniest comedy yeah. we've seen in a long time that was original. I started growing out my hair for five years because of that you movie. You didn't. Totally. Are you seriously I'm going to show you some pictures after. But that had such an impact on me that Apparently. all I can think of was, okay, I need to get my hair like Bradley Cooper's. And luckily I've got curly hair when I when it gets longer, so I'm like, I can do it. It is just really, really funny. Everything was great. I want to go to Vegas. I want a penthouse. I want, like, I want that experience, even though it's totally dangerous, and I do not recommend anybody do it. Why? I don't know. Like, was what was weird. it? I was that's... looking I'm like he's just so cool. I'm like, yeah. And I was in a weird spot. Uh, yeah, okay. I was in a really weird spot. Which you're like, allowed to be in. Yeah. So, and I was a lot younger too. So I was like, okay, I'm now out of school. I'm in a decent place. But I was moving to Calgary at that point. I'm okay. like, okay, I need to reinvent myself somehow. I need to go there, a different person. And so, you pick the character that Bradley Cooper plays. No, well, I picked his hair. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Not not his not his being. I don't think I could ever be that guy. Yeah. But. The se- the second and third one did not need to happen. Third one was even no one was even hung over in the third one. That's actually quite funny. Todd Phillips just decided, hey, let's close this out as a as a trilogy, and it did not hit at all. And that's what I think I hate the most about Hollywood is I feel like it's a business. Of it, course, it used to be a form of art, and now it's a yeah. business, yeah. right? Where everyone asks the question, okay, you have an original idea. Well, how can I make three of them? What's yeah. the long term viability of this platform? Like even for when Wolf Cop, they won their, their Cine Coup thing. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason that they won the first time was the people giving the award of a million dollars or whatever it was, was like, yeah, we can make a bunch of these movies and we can we can make action figures. We can make this and this and this yeah, and this yeah, off yeah. it, right? It's like, how can we make money? And I hate that because I feel like it leaves out like the, the, the artistry. Like Christopher yeah. Nolan makes movies because he loves to make movies. And he's not yeah. sitting there to make a movie uh, to make three of them. Right. And I know that pisses a lot of studios off. We're like, sure. well, why would I invest in a Nolan film? It's going to make me, you know, $250 million when I can invest in this film, fill in the blank, that has three of them. And I'm going to make a billion. Yeah. If you're a business person, you're going to make the billion. Of course. And that's what they look at it. And that's why he was reluctant to do The Dark Knight Rises, especially after the, de- the death of Heath Ledger. But they're like, well, The Dark Knight is one of the most revered movies that has come out in the past decade, at least at the point, at that point. It was so... Good. Yeah, it was it was groundbreaking in almost almost every level. It uh, and the thing with Nolan and is that he grounds his movies in a reality. He takes a character like Batman and grounds him in reality that you're like, a this is possible. B I believe it, and uh, C I'm following what's going on and I am not taken out. And a lot of movies that that kind of try to really jump the gun, they take you out of the movie. Sometimes, and you're kind of like, okay, I need to get myself back into the situation that's going on. Because in The Dark Knight, there's no point there where you're not in it. And I fell in love with the Joker's character. Like, of course. To be, and this is going to sound super strange for your audience, but th- there's something that I just find so fascinating and almost attractive mm-hmm. in the character of this this person that cannot be satisfied. Yeah. You, you, you can't pacify them in any way. He yeah. just wants chaos and anarchy. Like, yeah. hey, here's a here's hundred million dollars. Light it on fire. I don't. I don't want that. Yeah. I just want to see. What do you say? I want to see the world burn or whatever. Yeah. And that is the most terrifying concept I've ever seen in cinema. In yeah. cinema, like you want to start talking about horror movies. Yeah. yeah I used yeah. to have like crazy fear thing based things about Freddy Krueger and Jason growing up. Right. Yeah, but yeah, Like yeah. what are they? They just kill people. Yeah. There, there's something that that you can kind of um, you can kind of leave at the movie. Where for me, when we talked about the horror, The Exorcist is something that sticks with me for a while. Sure. Uh, when it comes to that stuff. Uh, so for that one, it was an ever-looming presence that he created with the Joker. And and the weird part is, spe- when it comes to villains, is 
you believe and buy that what they're saying and what they believe in is true okay. and that they wholeheartedly believe in what they're doing. And that is a very scary individual to go up against. Absolutely. What yeah. do you, like, what do you do? Yeah. There, there's, there's nothing. And he even said it. There's nothing you can do with your strength, which is what Batman has always said. I've got my strength so I can do whatever I can. You can't with him. No. And, and you can't pigeonhole him into anything. Love it. And you can, you buy what he says. I was agreeing with stuff that he was saying, not the way he was doing it, but that's what marks a really good villain when it comes to to that. It was so good. But for, because of that, they decided, okay, let's do the third one, and it was for me one of his one of Christopher Nolan's lowest points. Yeah, to me, it felt like you had to do it because you had to follow it up and finish yep. it. It felt rushed all over the place yep. and incomplete in a lot of places. Like yep. I had to give it a lot of grace. Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoyed it because. The character Bane I love too. Yeah. Uh, not in the same way as the Joker. But at the end of the day, I was like, well, I'm going to give you a pass on that because that didn't make sense. And his back was just broken and now he's climbing up things. And yeah. it feels like you can't recover from a back breaking in six weeks and, you know, all that sort of <laughs> Especially stuff. Especially in a pit that a guy just punches your back while you're hanging on a thing. Second of all, my biggest thing is how the hell did he get from where he was, this pit in the middle of nowhere? To Gotham. Yeah, there's a lot I'm of just fine. there's a lot of caveats where I'm like, nah, yeah. because your name's Chris Nolan, I'm gonna give it to you. Yeah, and and because he's Chris Nolan and he created a movie that is revered, the studio just looks at it as again dollars. Right? So That's why I hate and, studios. And and a lot of people do because they're always you know, uh, artistic people always fight with the studios. Um when you go to Marvel, why has it worked out? Well, they've got their guy in between, Kevin Feige, who's been able to kind of quarterback everything. Between the studios and the artists. Now, it has an he's incredible. Like, his interviews are great. He loves the properties. He um, he's, he's invested in everything. It was his plan to begin with. Mm. But a lot of it was predicated on the success of these movies. If Iron Man was not good, we would not be excited for anything. For no Infinity no, and War. And you're great. And when Robert Downey Jr. made his first sarcastic quip in that movie, I said... I'm going to be okay. Yeah, we're, we're good. Yeah. And it turned out to be amazing. It's still on people's top. Like, it could be a, a lot of people's number one list yeah, of all Yeah, I didn't movies. like Iron Man at all. Like, the character itself, I'm like, ah, I could yeah. take him or leave him. But I yeah. fell in love with his character of Tony Stark. I'm like, this guy's cool. He reminds you of Brett Wilson in a way, where it's like, yeah. this is a rich guy who doesn't give two rips about things. Yeah. And, and well, and that's the idea behind Tony Stark, too. Stan Lee has gone on record to say that he wanted to create a character that nobody likes but will ultimately root for. Yeah. And they nailed it with him. Yeah, absolutely. But And so when, when it goes to the comedies, they do the same thing. Hangar was great. We need a second one to make more money. Woof. We need a third one because the second one made money because people were excited about the first one. Then they get wise after the third one and it didn't do very well. So now they're like, okay, now we got to kill this horse. Anchorman, they've been working. They, Anchorman 2 wasn't that far off after it. And again, it was just, hey, remember what we did in the first one? The best part about Anchorman 2 was the advertising campaign that came yeah. out where Ron Burgundy was all over it. Weather yeah. Networks and he did up here in Canada, the, the curling on TSN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember where that. he was in real life. And yeah. I'm like, this is amazing. And that's actually what got excited me for the movie where I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome because I see him in real life here and the movie was... But then the movie failed. Yes. Failed. Um, and, and again, that's the tough thing with comedies. Deadpool 2, which you haven't seen yet. Um, I heard good things. And... and when I look at it, it's one of the best com comedic sequels I've seen in a very long time. People, people are saying it's better than the first. I Okay, from a joke and action standpoint, it's got more jokes, funnier Thanks. jokes. That's what I want. And the action is awesome. Sure. I like the first one, just the story was a little bit clearer and more concise. Right. You can tell that there was a focus going on. Who's the on. villain in this one? Uh, so it is Cable. Spoiler alert. Is a bad guy? Cable is the bad guy, but there's also another bad guy in there. And again, I don't want to spoil don't. it, but um, you've seen it. And in the trailers, there's a scene where Ryan Reynolds... I don't watch trailers anymore. Oh, okay. There's a scene where, where they're fighting. That's all I'm going to tell you. Okay. Um, but there is another... There's a, there's an overarching story over everything that I thought they did a good job in. But, you know, they, for them to add in the jokes and the fourth wall breaking, you, some of the story itself got a little bit choppy, at least for me. Okay. My brother... Nick, um, Anthony as well, they love the second one. And they did you go opening night? Do you do that? <laughs> yeah, we started doing that more often now. Um, and we've been going to like the theater where we can actually like book our seats because we seats. made the mistake. And I think every theater needs to Yeah, do what it. are we waiting for? I don't know. Man. Like, why are there still theaters? Just put a sticker on there with a the number on yes. it. I don't need like, I don't need anything crazy. Like, everyone's worried about, oh, well, what if we go there and they like it's, it's reserved? I'm like, what, you want to sit on the side? 
just to go see the movie. Yes. Just get Thank your you. ticket ahead of time. The only thing I can think about is they want me to like wait around for, sure. for the advertising. But I'm like, guys, I'll pay you a premium. Yeah. Especially for movies. So this, I'm going to back up here. Sure. I haven't been to a premiere for a long time. The first one I went to within the past probably three, four years was Infinity War. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being in that theater a few weeks ago, I guess, and remembering, oh my goodness, this is fun. Yeah. This is a bunch of nerds like myself yeah. who love and appreciate and know everything about what's going on here mm-hmm. and respect it. Mm-hmm. They respect it for what it is. And we can have fun. I'm in a safe place. So people are hollering, they're laughing, they're oh, cheering, yeah. they're standing, they're they're crying. Yeah. And like we're all in it together. We want to be there on a ride. And you only get that for premieres. Well, and you also get that with the type of the movie and the audience that you're there with. So when, even Deadpool, the first one, I went to it um, the opening day at like 3 o'clock. It was like in the after- afternoon thing. And the audience was packed. And everyone was laughing and enjoying like. There is a tough time take. Uh, there's a tough time recreating the theater experience when you have that many people in a room that are cheering, that are excited about things, that are like that that are just getting into the movie as much as you are. Yeah. Not all movies do that, but no. there are those movies like an Infinity War, even Deadpool two. People were laughing all over the place, and it was great because you're just it's like you're laughing with all your friends. It's like watching a movie with friends, and yeah. it's the one thing people talk about. Bigger TVs and the home theater experience and yeah. like movie theaters are going to die. Yeah. When I was there at Infinity War, I realized if they can figure out how to make this more often, mm-hmm. this experience, yeah. I'll pay big bucks to go to movie theater. Because it was yeah. it was a blast. Well, and it's tough to do that all the time, too, because a movie like Infinity War has been 10 years in the making. Yeah. So there was a lot. I had people that could care less about superhero movies that were excited for Infinity War. Yeah. And I was like, this is... This is like what Star Wars was back then. Sure, pretty close. And well, I would argue now the the way that Star Wars has been going, which I think is it's just too much Star Wars. And I've been, I was a fan of I've always been a fan of Star Wars, but I've never been a diehard. Right. So I probably be the same way. Although I yeah. did when I proposed to my wife and we got engaged, I had rented all six Star Wars for us to watch. Wow. That night, yeah, that's a super nerd story. You even went with the prequels. Yeah, I was like, let's start. Damn. Let's just do them all. And. I can't remember. I read it from Roger's video, and there was a guy there. His name was, I want to say like Blake or something like that. I actually know the guy still. Yeah. And he was like, man, like you're so lucky that I would be able to propose to a woman, commit my life to her, and then watch Star Wars for the next 14 hours. Truth be told, we got through half of the first one before, or the yeah. fourth one before we fell asleep. But Still, I mean, like, and, and, and so for me, when it, right now when I see the landscape that's going on, I'm like, this is too much Star Wars. Yeah, it's a ton. This is way too much. But I'm of the, I'm of the belief that I would rather... People try and fail than not try. People say, yeah. why are they doing another one? Yeah. And this is yeah, yeah. this kind of flies in the face of the whole sequel thing Yes, uh, that I just talked about because more often than not, sequels are bad. But I would honestly, I love the idea of there's a chance yeah. that it could be awesome. In this case, people would be like, oh, why a sequel to the Deadpool 2? Well, people are saying it's better than the first one. Well, and now they have now they, they, can, they can warrant a third one. Right. Because it's been doing well. It's been crushing at the box office. And if the first one didn't do good, they probably wouldn't do it. But that one, and I like that you mentioned Anchorman, is also predicated on the marketing. Because that Deadpool marketing, it is a stroke of genius from day one. Like, everything that they did. They went as far as to release all, I think it was all the superhero movies, or just all the X-Men movies, with covers of the original movie, but Deadpool's in them. That's funny. And they put them in the stores. Or at least one store or whatever I saw, which is incredible. More of that, please. More of that. Like, that was the best marketing. And he's from Regina, too, which helps. Of course. It's we're, a big deal. We're actually planning on sending him a Golden Knights jersey because. Well, I saw the Van City, re- I yeah. saw the tweet you guys put out. <laughs> Vegas Golden Knights or Saskatchewan's team, so. <laughs> Here's my thing about. All right, we talk about trailers for a moment. Yeah. I hate trailers. Fair enough. Back in the day, trailers used to be teasers. Yeah. They used to tease you about a movie, get you excited to go see it. Now. Especially after a movie is launched, I'll watch like the fourth version of a trailer, and mm. it is essentially the movie. A lot of times, and I nothing bugs me more than going to a movie, especially a comedy movie, which we'll get into at some point here. Yeah, where I'm like, oh, this is gonna be awesome, and every funny part is in the trailer, uh, or yeah. sometimes the funniest parts are in the trailer and not even even the movie. Yeah, one hundred percent. So I, I now I just skip trailers altogether. Yeah, and I'm like, ah, I think I like this movie. I'm gonna go watch it, and there's a greater chance because my expectations are so low. Yeah, yeah. That I might enjoy myself. Yeah, I know Anthony stopped watching trailers for a lot of the movies that he's excited for. Like, doesn't see a single one. 
I am now more on the mind where I'll watch the first trailer. Right, which is more of a teaser. Which is more of a yeah. teaser. If it's if it's forty five seconds or less, I'm in. Okay. Uh, if it starts, I can respect that. if it starts dipping into the minute, minute and a half or so, which you look at a minute of stuff spliced together in the entirety of let's say a two hour movie. I've had the argument made to me where it's like, well, it's just a small little fraction of the whole thing. I'm like, yeah, but if you show just one thing like they did in the Batman versus Superman stuff, they had a great first trailer. Then what they did is they showed the actual baddie in the second trailer. Right. So now it's no longer a Batman versus Superman movie because you've already taken out the fact that, well, they're going to make up to fight this guy and we haven't gotten to the movie yet. I can remember when Godzilla came out, like the first God, the first new Godzilla. Yeah, no, the two thousand one with uh, like Matthew sound, Broderick. Yeah, that sounds about right. And Oof. they never showed him at all. Yeah. And I, this is gonna date me. I didn't see Godzilla until it launched, and it was in the newspaper the day after it launched. Where it was like, there's a picture of Godzilla in Empire State Building or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, like that's what he looks like. Cause they were like, we're not gonna show you. Yeah. Come to the theater to see it. Well, I like that idea with Cloverfield too. Yes. The first Cloverfield specifically, and, and even Cloverfield, 10 Cloverfield Lane, which I, I love. Out of the three, that was my favorite one. But yeah. Cloverfield Lane? Uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane. That was so weird. Weird. But yeah. John, I'm a big fan of John Goodman. I like that. that he was tie very good in. in that movie. I like the dialogue that was in there. Like, I, I'm good with seeing people in a room as long as the dialogue is good and it's intriguing. So you like Tarantino and all this stuff? I do, but I, I wasn't a fan of Hateful Eight. As much okay. as I was, like, I'm a huge Tarantino guy, 100%. Hateful Eight, though, was the one where I felt he self-indulged a little bit. Okay. A little bit too much. Okay, But his enough. other stuff, like, the opening to Inglorious Bastards, I could watch that over and right. over People love and over it. Again. I mean, I see it, I respect it, I appreciate yeah. it, but for me, just make me laugh, man. Well, and I, and I know with Soph, like, she's, same thing with her, she's, she kind of likes it, but she's like, yeah, it's kind of boring, I'm like, and I'm sitting there like, no, but wait, something It can happen. be, I just need to be in the yeah. mood for it. If for I'm sure. in the mood for it, which is rare. Yeah. I can sit there and go, wow, like that. I can really appreciate what's happening here. But yeah. more often than not, and that's why I love comedy so much, and more so in the TV realm, yeah. I can turn on 30 minutes and laugh and not have to remember how it ties into the bigger picture. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and I think that's an, that's a, that's an important thing, and it goes back even to our DC thing. Why can't you just make a movie to make a good movie? Yeah. Why does it always have to tie into something? And everyone's saying that there's superhero fatigue and universe fatigue. Uh, DC Universe is pretty much tanked. They're still releasing Aquaman, but I don't think they're doing Flash. Remember Aquaman? Like, yeah. he's a real guy. Yeah. In Justice League, which yeah. I won't watch. Yeah. And I, they're launching a movie for this guy? Yeah. Skip it. See, and, and I'm more curious because I'm just curious. And I like James Wan as a director, so I'm like, okay, if they just stick to just let's do an Aquaman movie... You also fine. love movies, though. It's true, and most of the time, I like to give stuff as much of a chance as I possibly can, um, for the most part. And also, like you know, it's it's a lot. Like even just when we started doing the YouTube thing, I'm like, I'm having a tough time editing these videos together. And I'm right. sure you guys have probably, like the same thing with you guys, especially in the beginning. And I'm like thinking, I'm like, how the hell do they do that with full blown movies, right? Where they have hours and hours of shots together, and when you're looking through the credits, which before I didn't care, I just wanted to get to the end credit scene when we realized that end credit scene is part of the, the, the cultural zeitgeist of, of the movie going experience. Right. Now you're it is, right? There, now you're sitting there and you're waiting for it on almost every movie, which most of the movies don't have them, it's just the superhero ones. But when you look through all the people that are working there... It's crazy. It's bonkers. So I try, especially now that I'm older, I try to give everything the benefit of a doubt. Mm. Um, but I do, yeah, I just, I like the movie going experience. I like movies. I like the escapism of some of it. And when a movie sucks, it really pisses me off. Cause it's like, I don't know, someone going on a trip to Disneyland and then the whole thing's rained out. You're super excited for it. And then it just goes to hell and you're like, well, that sucked. Yeah. That, that happened to me recently. I can't remember. It's going to be bad for your podcast. I can't no, remember no, no. what movie it was. It was a comedy where I'm like, every good joke was in the trailer and now I'm annoyed at it. Oh, it was a sausage. Sausage party. Yes. Yeah. And which I should know because I used to find Seth Seth Rogen. Uh, yeah. I used to find him funny. Mm-hmm. And now I'm at like Seth Rogen does not make me laugh. Their penis, yeah. their penis jokes or dick jokes and and weed jokes. Yeah. And I laughed, but now I'm like, really? Like, give me something <laughs> else, Seth. Yeah. Like, I just watched his yeah. uh, Netflix special, Seth Rogen's Hilarity for Charity. Okay. And I'm like, Seth, like these are the same jokes that you always do, and you laugh at your own jokes, which is mm. fine. I think you should laugh at your own jokes. Yeah. But like. They're dick jokes, yeah, and they're weed jokes, yeah. There's there's nothing else in there. I can't do it. Yeah, I um I for me sausage party was good in some parts. Then there's a whole middle section that was whatever, 
And then the end was so audacious that I was just like, this is just bonkers crazy. Like, that ending was just, the orgy was just like, what the hell? I could not believe what, what it, I was it seeing. It was absolutely bonkers. And I wasn't laughing because it was funny. I was laughing at how ridiculous it was. And yeah, I, I've kind of, their brand of comedy is okay in, in some stuff. But, you know, I think a lot of it is also if someone else is holding, like the reins, like a Judd Apatow is working with them, then it works a lot better. Like I've, Seth Rogen's funniest stuff, I've enjoyed that Seth Rogen hasn't done. What are some of your favorite comedies? Oh man, um, not the, the favorite, but some like yeah, yeah, comedies some that you enjoy. Uh, TV shows or movies? Like mm, TV shows, the comedies on TV shows. I mean, Seinfeld will always be number one for me. I adore Seinfeld till the day I die. Okay. Uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine is probably my second. So you now. were happy that it was renewed? Oh, big time! I was devastated when they said they canceled it. I was I was not a fan. There was already like Save Brooklyn Nine Nine going on on Twitter, yeah, and I was, was a part of it and all that stuff. I just like muted all that stuff. Yeah, and so now that they got picked up, which I figured they were gonna get picked up because they have such a following. Um, but yeah, in terms of TV, it'll be Seinfeld and uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine, and then just a string of other. Yeah, I, I mean I can't remember off the top of my head. Movies though, um, Airplane for sure. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I love I love I love the old. Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, I love those types of movies. Like the, those, the airplane was a big one. Um, the naked gun I always liked. Okay. Those ones were good. Um, Jim Carrey stuff. I'm a huge Jim like Carrey the mask, fan. Like classic the Jim mask Carrey? is in my top 10. Wow. Cause it wow. Hit, and, and not to say, and I, and I don't, and if anyone says that the mask wasn't that great, I'll be like, you know what? It probably wasn't. But for me, it hit at just the right point Sure. that to this day, it's kind of, you know when people get married and they're like uh, in sickness and health, in yeah. good days and bad, till death do you part. I am aware of that. Yeah, that's the mask to me. Okay. To, in my when I'm sad, I'm watching the mask. If I'm sick, I'm watching the mask. If I'm having a crappy day, I'm watching the mask. That's like, funny. And and it was the same reason why I love Aladdin so much because of the genie. Whoa. Because the mask and the genie are very similar. Their okay. references, their fourth wall breaks, they're very similar characters, and that's also why I love Deadpool as a character. Very similar. That first Deadpool reminded me of the first time I watched The Mask. I'm learning so much about you. Well, the Mask, Deadpool, and the Genie. Yeah. Robin Williams. Yeah. Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. And Jim oh, Carrey. And Ace Ventura as well. Those are another one of the big ones. Yeah, I watched, I remember, if this is, you know, because comedies have a, a place in your life in terms of the timing, when you saw them. Absolutely. Right? Big time. So I saw Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, at the perfect moment of when I was, I think, like, between seven and nine years old. Yeah. And it was the funniest movie in the world to me. Yeah. Right? Like, in fact, it was probably a funnier movie than I gave it credit for because I was young and I just mm -hmm. wanted to see mm -hmm. weird and, and hear weird stuff. But yeah. for it you? was funny. Uh, I love I love the humor. It's like, okay, Seinfeld will forever be a classic and I respect yeah. it for what it is. And also, I, did you watch his uh, his stand-up on Netflix? Oh, yeah. I watched All the stuff that he had. They, they released three of them. They have the com comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Yeah. They did the other one where he was talking about the days of Seinfeld and leading up to it where the newer version. And they had an older version where they showed some of his stuff from the, the 90s. Did you see the shot where he had all of his notes for Seinfeld written? Oh, yeah. And it was like the entire street was covered with it? That bog was my mind. Yeah. Because we don't we don't give people enough credit for what they... Like the craft, right? Like, yeah. oh, you just made a joke that's funny. But it's, no, no, no. It's not just funny. Jerry Seinfeld has like years and years and decades and... In, in, um, well, not centuries. <laughs> of content written to try and make you laugh. Yeah. And he's constantly observing stuff and trying to find the humor in it. And I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. So I, I, Seinfeld is up there. Uh, I love the American version of The Office. Oh, yes. I, I just... Can't believe I forgot to say The Office. I yeah. just... I, I, I actually study it. Yeah. I study the characters and the delivery. And I'm a big fan of writing. Yeah. I didn't know I was, actually. So I'm going to back up there a little bit. Go for it. I was dating my wife. I don't think we were engaged yet. I was dating my wife. We both got sick. Okay. And so this is back in, again, the Rogers video days. And I went to Rogers and we said, you know, we're both sick on, on our deathbeds. <laughs> Why don't we rent a, a movie, a, a TV series that we never heard of before right. and just try it out? So we rented Heroes. Mm-hmm. And Heroes Season 1. And we loved it. Great. We're like, this is amazing. Save the cheerleaders. Save the world. Yeah. I, I fell in love with it so much, I put Peter Petrelli on the back of my uh, <laughs> hockey jersey. <laughs> Because I'm like, I love Peter Petrelli. I want to be this guy. And then the writer strike happened. Yeah. In the middle, I think it was the middle of season two. And in the middle of Lost. And <laughs> and it was never the same. 
Yeah. It came back and it was never the same. Like all the momentum fell off and it yeah. came back and it tried and failed. Then I'm like, oh, what about Hiro, Hiro Nakamura? Like it's all gone now. Yeah. So good writing is important to me. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm just starting this one again. Uh, rest of the development. Oh, yes. To me is... Brilliant. To me is the funniest show I have ever seen. It is, eh? Yeah, because <laughs> it's the only show where I actually have to sit with my... Like, my phone turned off, my watch turned off, my computer. Like, I have to sit and watch because there's a joke coming yeah. every every single moment of the show. Yeah. And I have to be listening and paying attention to the show to find all the jokes because there's jokes coming all over and they're yeah, smarter yeah, yeah. than I am. Yeah. And if I'm going to laugh at this the way I want to laugh at it, I have to, like, see, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and, the, and the thing with the rest of development is in the office, you can hear the jokes. Yes. Unless Jim's doing his off camera look. Arrested Development is is like all of Jim's uh, nonverbal cues because the majority of the hilarity in Arrested Development is in those parts you have to see. You don't, you hear some of it, like when Joe comes in and he starts talking and Tobias is interactions and stuff. But when you see the nuances in all the characters, the reactions to Stunning. things, all that, that's where I think the genius in Arrested Development is. And that's why I felt it fell off when it went to Netflix. Okay, so Netflix, did you have you rewatched the, I, the re-edited version? Uh, I rewatched. Well, I rewatched the the season that they put out once they picked it up. Okay. Uh, the one where uh, his son's in college and. But it's and, all like the first person perspectives. Yeah. We're all mad at that because they. I think the story is that they couldn't get everyone together. Right. And so they just did their best to film it. So they just went back and re-edited them all into an actual show now. Okay. And they released it at the beginning of this month, May. Okay, I haven't seen that. And yet. so. That that season is out again properly because yeah, I think yeah. everyone was so pumped on. I think it was season four. Yeah. So pumped on season four, and it came out. We're like, this is not what it's supposed to be. It feels weird and forced, and I can see the fact that there's like they're not all in the same room. Right. So they spent tons of time re-editing it, just pushed it out to the point now where you actually probably can't even go back and find the original version on Netflix. It's buried so like far in the algorithm. <laughs> that's awesome. You can't even find it. I'm, I'm happy with that then. Season five comes out at yeah. the end of this month. So I'm, that's why I'm, I'm catching up again. No, absolutely. Well, and, and that's where I'm kind of, now that you mentioned that, I'll have to go back to it because that was another one I really liked. Uh, community. See, I thought that was good. People love Community yeah. and I haven't gotten into it. Uh, I was good up until the third or fourth season and I think that's when they had their issues in the fourth season. Like, or after the fourth season what of Community. What do you mean issues? Um, they, well, they were running out of ideas and every time they do, for me, the, the dividing point is anytime a season or an episode of the show has to go back and relive moments. It's kind of the same thing as a sequel where it's like, hey, remember when we did this? Right. So in The Office, when they had that one character actor who was in everything comes back and he's doing an assessment before they bought out, or they got bought out by Saber. And it was in that middle ground where my, where they were going to get bought out by Saber. What season is this? Uh, this would be season five or six. I say six? I think six. Um, because they did the audit. And that's when they had Computron. And Dwight was pretending to be Computron. Right. And then they go to the back and they kick Toby out. And Dwight was in place to take care of the HR stuff to make sure that Toby doesn't say anything that'll screw up their right. audit. But what they ended up doing, that episode was just callbacks to everything. So it would, the, the character would ask... Well, have there ever been any incidents in the thing? And then they'd go back to all the incidents where... The reliving. <clears throat> the reliving of the moments. So a lot of times it's a transition period. And they did that in Community in Season 4. And you can tell that they're running out of ideas. It wasn't as funny. The characters didn't seem to be as into it. There wasn't anything innovative about it. It seemed like a lot of it was rehashing what happened in the first couple seasons. Mm. So that's when I was like, okay, it fell off. And, and, I, and I think the majority of the people that have seen it agrees that it fell off. Even Seinfeld did some stuff like that too. It's funny... Because there needs to be the self-awareness for these shows yeah. to say, hey, we're done. And I've always championed that a lot of shows go on way too long. But it's the, the money side of it, right? Hey, that people is, are still watching. Yeah. Like, just continue to try and let us sell ads yeah. for this stuff. But, like, more shows need to go, no, it's yeah. done. And that's what I loved about Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, Next to the Wire, is probably my favorite TV show ever. I adore it. And I love The Wire as well. And, and what both of them knew is when to stop. They offered Vince Gilligan a lot of money to continue on with Breaking Bad, and he's like, no, like, my story stops here. Isn't The Wire commonly held as the number one show of all time? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it is It is quite the... I, and I haven't seen it in such a... Like, I, I was watching it when it was out. Right. Um, But it, so many characters have come out of there. Like, the great Giselba has come, came out of there. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's revered by many, many people. 
Uh, the thing with a lot of shows... Uh, oh, sorry. How I Met Your Mother was another one I was going to mention. Okay. The first couple times I've watched How I Met Your Mother, I thought it was the funniest show ever. Now, when I go back to it, my issues lie with the fact that it's inconsistent. Um, they lose a lot of their magic as well. As it goes on to the seasons, there's a lot of things introduced in season six that, well, why are you bringing it up now when you could have brought it up earlier? Because right. you can't support it. And they ran on for probably four seasons longer than they should have. So speaking of seasons that have gone on too long, yeah. you like Lost. I did like Lost. Like the first two seasons, okay. third season, and the writer strike happened, and then they introduced a whole bunch of shit that they could not explain. <laughs> right. So I, I never, haven't watched Lost, yeah. and, and I'm thankful I haven't, but I, I have an older brother who loves, he loves this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he hated Lost, and I can't remember why he hated Lost. I think he hated Lost because everyone else loved Lost, and he's kind of a contrary in that oh, way. Oh, that's fair. He loved the last episode of Lost when the entire world was mad. Yeah. Because all these things went unexplained. And he, yeah. and he was just like, I told you it sucked. <laughs> I told you the whole time you were wasting your time. Oh, uh, man, writer strikes the worst. But yeah, yeah, coming back to things about writing, like, I don't value good writing enough. Yeah. Because good writing is a rare thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that that's funny. But you know why that's funny? Because it was written well. Yeah. And so, like, you've got writing, you've got acting. Um, but in terms of comedies for movies, because yeah. movies and TV are different, right? Like, Absolutely. TV, I can have 24 episodes. Yeah. Traditionally, over the new Netflix world, I have at least 10 or 12 episodes. <laughs> Yeah. To tell the story. Right? And and the good thing about the Netflix one, um, and sorry to cut you off, is that they're actually able to say, okay, you have all of this whole entire season. So before it's released, it's already shot. Yeah. Which means that they're not going week to week. Which then means that they're able to have a clear storyline the entire season. Whereas a lot of network TV, it's week to week. There's rewrites in between. There's stuff going on. And because it's released once a week, they lose a lot of that, and and also the the thing of well, we're only renewing you for one season. Yeah. So what do you introduce in season one, that can carry over to season two, that doesn't go too far? Next they go, okay, well we're renewing you for three and four. Well now we've got to explain stuff that we brought into season one that we couldn't finish off in season two. Now we have to introduce more things to keep the show going for right. three and four. And I think that that happened with Lost, that happened with Entourage, that happened with um, those two specifically that I remember, um, because they didn't have, they were always on a on a lease of a year, sure. and then they didn't know if they were going to get picked up again. I uh, didn't Big Bang Theory just get signed for three more years. That show needed to die so long ago. Three more years. Number one show on TV, I think. I cannot believe that. Easily the number one comedy on TV. It well, might not be the number one show, yeah. but it's pretty darn close. And even The Office, I was at one point, I'm like, hey, this this should have left. This should have been done I, when I, when, uh, when Michael left. Yeah, and, and Michael is the show to me. Like me Michael, too. And when I hear rumors about Mindy Kaling was on Twitter the other day saying, man, I would love to, and she said this, I would love to write Michael Scott's perspective on things like Trump. And oh yeah, like, you know, uh, she talked about different things like in YouTube and all this sort of stuff, and I'm like, yeah. yes, I would love to see that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. when you take the soul out of that, because Michael was that character that you, you really like, you hate it because he was so disrespectful. Yeah. But you love because he was so aloof. Have you seen the British version? Yes, but I don't like British comedy. Not Speaking of comedy, really. Yeah, I don't. I don't oh, enjoy it. I don't know what it is about British comedy. I'm on board with it. The difference for me between um, Michael Scott in the American one and. Um, Ricky Gervais. Ricky Gervais's character. I never liked Ricky Gervais's character. Mm. I could never get behind that character. You never character. felt any empathy for him? No empathy for him. Michael Scott, however, especially after the first season, there was a lot of moments in there that they introduced to the character that I cared for him and I understood where he came from. And I've always had this theory that he only acted that way because the cameras were around. Maybe he was different behind the scenes. Because there was one particular episode in season two it was a halloween episode and they showed how he reacted when kids were coming up for candy and he was super excited and he seemed very normal mm-hmm. he didn't seem like he had to act for the cameras or get really awkward for the cameras right and i'm like that's michael scott mm. not the michael scott that we're shown it's in these little moments when the cameras are looking at him from far away that is the michael scott because yeah, he's genuine he's genuine he's insecure yeah. and we all kind of get the fact that he's <clears throat> Trying his best to fit in and make friends, but he yeah. can't. And he never has. The one episode where where he was showing the kids when it was bring your kids to work day, and he was like he was like I wish I had a lot of kids so that I would always have friends. He was he's a very sad 
character. He's a very complicated character. And he's just always been someone that's always wanted to be accepted. And another episode which even proved that was when Pam was holding her art show. And everyone was talking to Pam about, like everyone was saying, you know, she has no courage in her, in her, um, in her art. No one was giving her any mind. And then Michael sees it and it's just the building. And he's so connected with it. And he turns to her, he said, I'm so proud of you. And she gives him a hug. That's another moment where like, oh. I'm like, that is Michael Scott. He believes in everybody. And he's just trying to get people to believe in him. At least that's what I got from the character. Whoa, like that's so good. I was, that's just my thing. Yeah, more of that in the world. Like, if I could hang out with Michael Scott, mm-hmm. Aziz Ansari. Oh, man. Uh, Master of None. Wonderful show. Uh, who else was it? Mrs. Doubtfire. Like, I would just be so happy <laughs> oh, yeah. in life. Mrs. Doubtfire was a great one. I can't believe I forgot that. And, and Robin Williams moves in general. Like, Robin Williams was tough to handle, though, when he was when he was serious. Like, yeah. Good Will Hunting. I didn't mind that. Like, Death to Smoochie was, was like, oh, it was yeah. a lot for me. That was a great movie. Uh, one Hour Photo. Yeah, that, that, was, that was also creepy too. Because to me, shit. he was always the funny guy. And yeah. my favorite movie of all time is Hook. Hook. See, and everyone hates it. There's no reason to hate that movie. I don't understand why people do not like Hook. It is rated so low. People always talk about Spielberg movies, and they're like, "Oh, no, there, there's Hook." I'm like, Shh, "It's shut one of the your mouth. to me. To me, it's one of the greatest movies, imaginations I've ever seen." Yeah, it, it just the whole. I saw it again. I, again. The caveat, I saw it at the perfect age. I was like the seven to nine thing, and it just yeah. won me over. I love baseball, yeah. so that's in there too. The idea of flying is, I have an affinity for flying. Mm-hmm. But like the, just the whole idea of, oh man, the colors and the imagination, and I just, yeah, it's long. I can't get enough of it. I can't yeah. get enough of it. Like even Dustin Hoffman in it, and him being him being like wrestling with suicide and Smee and some of the jokes there. Oh and, man, the boo box. Yeah, like I'm I just still terrified of the boo box. I couldn't day. get enough of that movie. And to this day, yeah. I will watch it from beginning to end at any time. If you're listening to this <laughs> and you want someone to watch Hook with, I'm your guy because I'll watch it and I just appreciate everything about that movie. Yeah, and and a lot of times I struggle with movies that bring me moments, and I struggle with movies that bring me a complete experience. Like there's and and I have this argument with Anthony all the time where he's a moments guy. So if the whole movie's crap, but there's one good thing in it, he will love that movie. What's his example? Um, I think he said, uh, well, Batman versus Superman. He says is great for a couple moments in there. Again, he's a big superhero guy, and uh, he hated Guardians too. Um, I really like Guardians too. Um, and I know a lot of people don't look at like it as much, but I think they don't. I don't like using the thing as oh you didn't get it. I don't think um, they realize that it was a tighter story. It was so much fun too. It was yeah. It was it was a tighter story. It was a man Peter Quill trying to reconnect with any memory he had of his mother, even though he had a family that like a a, a, a family that kind of adopted him, right? The Guardians themselves. They right. are a family. And I, I thought it was great. I liked it. Yeah, it there were was some things. Great. It, I, I don't it was know a great if, movie. It was a great movie. So, but for him, th- there weren't enough moments in there that he remembers because he asked me the question. He's like, "Well, what, name me some moments." I'm like, "I can't because as a movie in total, I look at it as a movie in total. I can't just give you one moment. What I'm going to get give you the chain when he punches his dad after he says that you broke my Walkman and you killed my mom. Like that was a powerful scene, right? So, anyways, with with Hook, I like the movie a lot. Um, and it was the same kind of situation. It hit me at the right time. I've seen it many times. And the um, the food fight. So good. Always gets me. Rufio always gets me. Always. When you're screaming Rufio. Um, his training. The thimble. Yeah, um, even the, the Hook kiss. walking up the stairs was terrifying to me when I was seven years old. I was like, like I said, what is happening right box. now? Yeah, and then that, that rattled me. The boo box, like like I said, I mentioned it. It's just great. Uh, Smee loved as a character as me. But Bill Hop, uh, Hoskins, Hoskins, yeah, I think Bob Hoskins, he's great. And those moment and and it's the price of admission just when he becomes Peter Pan and that music comes in, like, and he just does that peek up in the sky, comes back down, he's flying around, everyone's so good. And then when Rufio says, "You are the Pan," and he gives him the sword, right? Like the, there, there was, a, there were so many moments tied in there. And that's a case of a movie that has so many moments that bring the movie together. It's the greatest movie of all time. <laughs> it's on record by Greg that it's the greatest movie of all time. Okay. But speaking of movie experiences. Yeah. What is, and this is different than the greatest movie. Okay. What is the best movie experience you have ever had? And this is in a theater. 
in in a theater. Yes. Oh man, if I can remember. Um, okay, I'll say one of the greatest. Yeah, yeah, one of the greatest. Well, uh, I mean, in, in Infinity War is definitely up there, but it's it's very recent. Deadpool was another one because everyone was laughing. Um, shit. I can talk while. Please go, 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 go. I'll, I'll think of something. Avatar. Oh, crazy. Avatar changed my life. Did he? Yes. So, I, so? I, I, Avatar, I had I had a final the next day. I had no intention of seeing this movie at all. Yeah. Don't care about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still don't care about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having it, Having watched it. My friend saw it the night before and said, Greg, you need to see this movie. And I was like, why? He said, the 3D in this movie is insane. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, I don't really care. And he, this friend, we all have those cynical friends. Sure. They don't get excited about much. Sure. But when they do, it's you give deal. it to them. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay, like, you don't get excited about anything, so I'm probably going <laughs> to go to this movie. So I, I had a final the next day. I'm like, nah, screw it. Yeah. Went to the movie at like 9 o'clock at night. And I had the perfect seat for this movie. And my, you know, 3D glasses, if it fills up the frame perfectly and you don't have to move uh, your eyes around. Yeah. It's just like, there's like a like two or three, maybe two rows and six seats in each row that's like the perfect height. And it's not too high. Yeah. It's like six rows up yeah. right in the middle. It's like the perfect Sheldon seat where he is like the movie theaters are the best viewed from yeah, this spot. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same sort you of thing. that seat. And the opening scene with these, these balls that are floating in the air. And I was like, mm. wait a minute. And I saw the screen open up. <laughs> And I'm looking into into the screen, and I realized, oh my goodness, I'm on Pandora, and everything was different. Yeah. From then on. Yeah, I, I, hey man, in terms of in terms of uh, in 3D, any 3D movie, nothing will touch Avatar for me. It. You were in. It. I have not gushed about a movie like that for a long time, and yeah. I, I I say that it changed my life because, I was like, oh my goodness. 3D is a thing. And since then, it has never been touched. No, because right. nobody shoots in that way either because he shot it legit in 3D. So most of the movies that you watch in 3D, it's just a cash grab because they, what they do is they render the 3D after. And it's an extra $2 on your ticket. Yes, it is. Which is a big, like, I hate 3D for that because very few of them are like that. Um, I remembered Lion King. I was very young when it first came out okay. but that was the first movie theater experience i remember and mm-hmm. i remember bawling my eyes out when when simba was by, and i still do if i watch when Mufasa died yeah when if i watch the lion king to, still to this day that scene will break me it's powerful there is no other there there i mean there's the uh, the opening of up will always break me okay every single time but the lion king i remember specifically and the next one when i was younger was toy story I thought Toy Story was the coolest thing. And I had this weird complex after where I made sure to play with all of my toys. That is so funny. Dude, it was I was a <laughs> I was a weird I was a weird kid. Uh plus my parents were immigrants and they were super scared of everything, so I had a lot of time by myself. That's funny. So um I made sure that I played with all the toys at, at any chance You're I You're an empathetic get. guy, hey? Yeah, I really, really am. Because yeah. I look at, because maybe we see the world the same way in this. To me, kids' movies mm-hmm. are my last bastion of hope for, for imagination. Yeah. I look at adult films, even adult books, and I'm like, everything is so, like, extreme in a way. Like, yeah. I go to, like look at uh, fantasy books. Yeah. And it's, like, all super violent, super sexual, super you know, demonic, whatever it is. It's sure, all super sure, sure. one way. Yeah. But I look at kids' films, and I'm like, wait a minute, there's like, original thoughts here. Like, hey, wait a minute. The weather is food? Right. Oh, like, what's that like? Yeah. Or the toys talk to me? Or my emotions are actually beings inside my head that... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what I loved about... Um, uh, what's the movie? I'll when, find the it. The one you just mentioned? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Now you got me. I know. I feel like an idiot now because I keep forgetting these movies. I'll find it. Shoot. I'll find it. No. Are you cheating and looking at your phone? Of course I am. I want to... Am s- I cheating? Inside Out. Oh, it's funny. Wonderful movie. I'm wonderful, glad you didn't, I'm glad you didn't say emojis. No, God, no. I would have... <laughs> killed, I, did I say the word emoji? Maybe that's what I did. No, no. I don't think you But did. Inside Out crushed me as well. Mm. Um, because it like... But it gives you that other imagination... Like that, that other side of things where it's like, okay, my mind is this. I can eat the weather. Right. Or food's coming from... Yeah, there, there's a... There is a return to innocence with it, I think. Oh, man. I'm the kind of guy... And this is, this is so weird, but I, I might have a Saturday afternoon to myself. Yeah. And I want to go to the movie theater and watch the kids' films because I I love imagination, I love humor, I love all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. And Pixar, Pixar specifically, yeah. gives me a lot of that. But I, I can't go to a movie theater in the middle of an afternoon on a Saturday by myself. Like that looks so creepy and strange. For the kids' movies, yeah. Yeah. I, I usually go to more those. serious ones by myself in the yeah. afternoon if I'm like I've got some time to kill. Yeah. But yeah, I think a lot of those is a return, like because they allow you to be imaginative and, and you're in a safe space where you're like. 
yeah, I can think of this way. Whereas if you think this way outside, in the outside world, people are going to be like, you're ridiculous. Like, you're, you're weird, you're whatever. Or you have to get back to reality now. I love it so much. It's great. And, and that's where movies um, in general are what's great. Like, what, for me, what's great about movies is that escape. Now, some escapes are different than others. Mm. Some are like, I'm watching these people being hunted down and it's not me. So I'm, I'm worried about them. Right. Uh, I saw a quiet place recently. I was going to ask you about it. I heard I heard incredible things. Wonderful movie. Yeah, I need to go see it. Wonderful movie. And t- Krasinski, man, I got no idea. Right, the but office. It's like, like Peel. Like Jordan Peel gets brings Get Out, another wonderful movie. This one is vastly different. Can I offend you for a second? No. I saw Get Out. Okay. It was fine. That's fine. I think with Get Out, and, um, and I've said this before, Get Out and even Black Panther to an extent, has much more um, cultural impact than overall. Like, what I liked about Get Out is that your main character wasn't an idiot. And he was, in fact, uh, when you look at him, doing things that, like, he was aware of things going around. The whole theme is stay woke. So he was aware of it. Um, But there are, like every movie, there are flaws. But I think a lot of it is because... You have a black director, black actors being stuck with a white family with these two weird black housekeeper type of thing and you realize what it is after and what they're doing to it, which is essentially cultural appropriation. Yeah, no, it was a great and, and, movie. And, but, but the themes are bigger than how, like, are greater than the movie itself. Yes. And and with Black Panther as well, it, the themes and the impact it has on, our, on, on the cultural zeitgeist, I'll use that word again, was more impact, was bigger than the movie itself, sure. which helped elevate the movie to yeah, uh, like nobody imagined Black Panther would do as well as it did. No, it crushed. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, and even Kevin Feige, they he went on record saying to Ryan Coogler, "Was like this is the best movie we've made," but it had such an impact on. on and that. I'm gonna give you that, and I think that my gap for saying the Get Out was fine was that the yeah. fact that I felt the cultural uh, push for it. Mm-hmm. And in how we kind of owned that. I'm like, that's great. And yeah. I love that. And I love, it gets me excited for the movie. For sure. But at the same time, expectations double and triple and quadruple yeah. and quintuple. And I was like, okay, I would see Get Out. My friend called me and he was like, this is my favorite movie of all time. Ooh, and I'm like, wow. It's a bold statement. I was like, wow. Like it just like usurped everything else. Uh, like, yes, this is it. And I'm yeah. like, okay, this movie is going to be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be better than Hook. <laughs> just, just kidding. Just kidding. And, uh, <laughs> And it was it was good. Yeah, it was good, but it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't as good. And and I'm worried that people are gonna feel bad for saying stuff like that. Like for you just said, it's like no, yeah, and, you know, and, and I don't and, think and you shouldn't. Saying, me saying that it was that I thought it was fine. I'm not speaking about the what it's actually speaking to. I'm not speaking with yeah. the themes of the movie or the cultural impact. I'm just saying like as a movie itself. Yeah, I thought it was fine. And like, people, I enjoyed myself. And a lot of people can't divide the two. They think it's part and parcel. And I'm like, no, it's not. And that's that's a. That's that's on you that's putting it as one package thing together because it's not. The movie and the message that's there, they are for me, they're they are one and the same because they're in one package. However, there are two different things going on there. If you look at movie structure in general, if you're very critical and you just take the movie on its own, take all the baggage out of the way, and you just strip it down as a movie, it's for me it's good. It's I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I don't know if I can watch it again because it was, you know, there was the I was like, damn. Right, but the cultural relevance, the 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 talks that you have after for me, are separate from the movie. The movie just let me that led me to there. Sure. Right. Um, but yeah, going back to a quiet place. Great movie. I I was I was eating popcorn, and I I felt I was compromising the family. I felt I was going to kill off. Right, because 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 yeah, okay. and and the the beauty of that movie is the absence of sound creates the horror aspect of it. Right. And then when it comes in. It's not a jump scare, which I'm not a huge fan of jump scares. Um, not that they scare me. It's just I'm like... They can, they can be kind of cheap, right? They're, they're, they're a cheap way to do it, right? But it's that absence of sound. When sound is then introduced, you're kind of thinking like, wait a minute, did they heighten this? Or is it just because I haven't heard anything for a very long time? Mm. So I'm sitting there eating popcorn. It's like crunch. I was like... You're going to kill them. I'm going to kill them. It's my fault <laughs> that they're going to die. It's crazy. Um, and horror movies, much like com- uh, comedies, don't get recognized in Oscars. No. You know why? Because they suck. Most of them. There have I, been some good horror... Lately, horror movies have been doing very well. Uh, Lights Out was another one that did very well, box office-wise. Um, it was the guy from Avatar, the, the Papa Dragon, 
or whatever, uh, the bad guy from Avatar. Yeah. He was in Lights Out. He these kids go into this house and I don't. Oh, want to I wanted it. to see that, dude. I'm not gonna spoil it for you. You have to see it. It is it is wonderful. Yeah, and I hate horror movies, but that was on my list because yeah. it looks smart. Yeah. The and Witch, I... The Babadook is another one, and they're, and they're gearing more towards cultural relevance as opposed to uh, the Boogeyman. Yeah, I just hate movies that are that, that feel cheap to me. Yeah. Like. Call me to the same way. Call me to, you're, you're going to get classic uh, drug jokes, sex jokes, yeah. whatever jokes. And the, to me, the I'm like, cheap jokes. Yeah, and I'm like, if it's cheap, I don't care about it. Like, yeah. give me, and that's why I love Seinfeld so much because it's observational humor, and to me, it's more difficult. Where I can go yeah. make, I can go make a sexual joke and make people feel uncomfortable, and they're going to laugh, and it's fine. Yeah. But I want smart things. So for horror, I hate horror movies yeah. because to me, I'm like they're lazy. It's yeah. like, yeah, there's some impervious being that's going to kill everyone else. And then they're going to find a way right. to kill him and expose the weakness and they're going to yeah. kill him and that's the end of the movie. And that's why something like uh, someone recommended, uh, and I hate horror movies, just mm. so you know, but someone recommended this movie, It Follows. Oh yeah, that one was crazy. And it, and, 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 and not, again, that's a good, I, I put it in the good category. Yeah, like it, it kind of rocked my world. It's hard to explain if you haven't seen it. It's yeah. like, kind of like a demon STD. Yeah, it's it, 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 almost like a message of don't have sex. <laughs> kind of, yeah. But like, Wear a condom. <laughs> what I thought was interesting about the movie was the the bad guy in the movie takes the shape of a human. Yeah. And you it, it only walks. Yeah. It can never run. It will only walk. But no matter where you are, it follows you. Right. And so you could drive three days, but you know this thing's following you. And it was a different kind of fear, right? Yeah. You know, like, oh, Freddy Krueger's around somewhere. He's going to kill me. He's, I mean, I'm or I'm in this camp. Whereas yeah, this one, it's like, yeah. It doesn't matter where you are. This thing's coming for you. Mm. You don't know what it looks like, yep. and it will it, it'll get you. And it was a kind of like it was a whole different take on on fear. And I thought it was smart. Uh, the wit uh, the visit was another one, which M Night Shyamalan's had a weird rocky you know history with his movies. I mean, Sixth Sense was a cultural phenomenon, but for me, the ending got spoiled for me sure. before I could That's see too it. Bad. So it was like the rest of the movie doesn't matter. I'm, I'm I put Unbreakable as one of his best movies ever. Hated it. Really? Okay, but then I rewatched which is, it which is five fun. years later and I understood it way more and loved it. And now to this day, it's actually even more relevant because yes. of the, the superhero culture that we have. But The Visit is another one which I recommend watching. And it's it's based on the uh, medical phenomenon called sun, do- uh, sun downing or sun dogging or something. So when the sun goes down... Um, it messes with people's chemical makeup in their brain and they kind of go crazy at night. I'm sorry, this is a real thing? This is an actual real thing. He was actually going to call it sundowning. He was actually going to call it sundown or sundowning or something, but he ended up calling it The Visit. I would recommend watching that. It sounds made up. It is It is a legit thing. and it. it now, they probably... I'm imagining... Uh, Brett that was talking about it said that there are people that have... Uh, that are on record to have very similar reactions as they had in the movie. Um, the visit it's going on my list on IMDb right yeah, now yeah 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 do it it is it is good I was surprised and they have kids in it and usually kids kind of make or break a movie for me but the kids were actually good in it when you, when you get past it um, good horror movie The Witch was another really good one um, going back to some of the old ones obviously Psycho is a classic um, the Hitchcock movies but again those movies I feel will almost never be recognized because the same with comedies because of their subjectivity a lot. Um, a movie like Black Swan, which is kind of a horror movie, but it's a psychological... Kind of, Kind yeah. of. Sure. Um, but it's still more of that psychological thriller than it would be a psychological horror yeah, movie. Yeah, and I prefer thrillers more yeah. than horrors because I feel like they're smarter. Right. Because they're, they're, they're messing with more things in the mind. And that's what I think a lot of horror movies are doing now. A Quiet Place is really an interesting look at our society now where everything's so loud. And so, like, if, if we had to stay quiet for an hour... I don't there's think no people way. can do it. It's funny. I, I have a friend, uh, or I'll call him a friend, uh, even though we've only hung out a few different times. Uh, he just went on a retreat where he couldn't speak for, I think it was a week. And I, he couldn't yeah. even look someone in the eye. I wouldn't be able to do that. For seven days! I wouldn't do That's a horror movie right there. Not the fact that I wouldn't be speaking, but if you can't look anybody in the eye. I'm sure he paid for it. And that one person looked up and was like, I can do a lot of bad things. That's That could be its own horror movie. Yeah. I'm sure it is for a lot of people, yeah. but I'm with you. Like, <laughs> yeah. we have no idea how to live without our cell phones for yeah. four hours, mm-hmm. let alone talk or hear noise. Or there's a lot of people that can't listen to music for, you know, for for thirty minutes. I there, I've gotten to the point right now, which is really bad on me, that I'll be watching TV, let's say, and I go upstairs to go grab something, a bite to eat. 
I'll put something on YouTube so something's in the background. It's bad. That is terrible. It's terrible. But now when I get in the car, I don't listen to uh, movies. I, or I don't listen to music. I listen to a lot of podcasts now. Sure. Um, and I, I just have that going. I may not say anything for hours sometimes. That's why I like long, long trips. When I drive to Calgary, my folks live in Calgary. Yeah. I go and visit. And if I'm lucky enough to be there by myself, I'll listen to podcasts for eight hours straight. And you just go. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I'm catching up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, uh, unless I wanted to throw in some of my throwbacks. Once I get into the 90s throwbacks and stuff like that, Tony Braxton, then I go into my 80s playlist, then I start screaming at the top of my lungs because that's, that's my jam. That's my jam. That's really funny. But, I mean, uh, people have had the conversation with um, Oscars related to comedies, horrors, and now superhero movies. Um, Logan. Did you get a chance to see Logan? Yeah. People, Better than I thought. Uh, Way I, more violent than I expected, too. It was it was the movie that <laughs> any fan of Wolverine wanted to see. And everyone was like, this should be nominated for Best Picture. This should be nominated for this. It got nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, Which, for those of you who don't know, is what? Uh, it's when they take an original source and they adapt it to the movie. So a comic book, let's say. Any comic book movie now has, has been adapted from a source. Gotcha. And so that screenplay has been adapted to the screen. Gotcha, okay. So, and, and a lot of the movies pull from different things, sure. right? Um, so Logan was pulled from the Old Man Logan uh, storyline, and then it was pulled from other storylines from other comic books. Spliced together, here you go, your movie. Cool. Um, a lot of people were, you know, and the Joker, when the, when Heath Ledger won for the Joker, uh, what bothered me is people were like, well, that was a consolation one because he died. I'm like, no, no, no. If you look at all the supporting actors that were nominated, that was the best performance. I'd even argue he was the lead in there. That's funny. But that was like kind of the first step. I'm like, oh, this this superhero movie got nominated. That's funny because I have this thing against Leonardo DiCaprio. When Leonardo DiCaprio won, I'm like, yeah. ah, shoot. <laughs> he's going to win because he's the best out of all these guys. Like, he yeah. didn't have good competition that time. And I'm like, oh, you should have won. But sometimes they win because of a body of work. So Scorsese won for The Departed. Right. He should have won for Goodfellas. He should have won for Taxi Driver. He should have won for Raging Bull way back when. But a lot of the, his win and DiCaprio's win was almost like... We're now finally taking account all of your work. Right. Finally. Plus, you crushed it this year with your movie. It bugs me. So, I mean, and, and it's tough, though, because then... I it, get it, but yeah. it bugs me. Yeah, that's fair. It bugs me. Because you're voting on... This is like the same thing if you're a sports person for the NHL awards. Yeah, yeah. They give out awards, and it's like, okay, it's your turn to win the award. I'm like, why? Like, okay. But yeah, yeah, it, yeah. this person was terrible this year. Well, okay. in this case, like, the, the Departed was fine. It, did he deserve Best Director for it? No. Go make another... Go make another uh, uh, amazing movie. Yeah, but that's tough to do sometimes because we, we as an audience are kind of getting to a point They'd where... They'd be okay with not giving him the award. <laughs> I don't know, man. He kind of... But when you look at somebody... For me, when you look at somebody like a DiCaprio and uh, who's done amazing work recently, um, well, almost his entire body of work has been amazing, um, except I didn't care for the beach that much. But when you look at a Scorsese, the fact that they never got Oscars before that... For me, it's like, that was a travesty. You guys better make up for it. No, to me, it's like, that's that's See, life, man. I don't, but again, I I, I don't know. There's I, no, I can't agree there's with no that. There's no objectivity in that. It's like, yeah, okay. But you, he still you, made you a enough. great movie. See, if if we look at, I'm, 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 I'm seeing you're Googling this thing, okay? The year that Scorsese won. You're going to pull up who he's up against? Scorsese. This Martin's, is for The Departed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Martin Scorsese, Oscar win the year. Uh, what was that? I'm going to guess 2005. 2007. Okay. Close, close. Uh, who was he up against that year? You know I'm going to pick, I'm going to be a contra <coughs> contrarian just because. Oh, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. So best picture, The Departed won. Yeah, you mentioned that. Over Babel, Letters from Iwo Jima, Little Miss Sunshine, and The Queen. Okay. So The Departed, I haven't seen in those other movies, so... <laughs> I, I can't say anything. That Hold way. on, but didn't... didn't uh... Oh, best directing. Alejandro Gonzalez in Arito for ba Babel. Uh, Clint Eastwood for Letters from Iwo Jima. Stephen, Stephen Fryers for The Queen. And Paul Greengrass for United 93. These are all the directors, but didn't Helen Mirren win for Best Actress in The she Queen? She did. Right, so that that's probably a decent movie. Oh, I've, I've heard it's a really good movie, but... But not as good as The Departed. I, I, yeah, and, and the thing the way the Oscars works are the, is this. They're, do you know how the Oscars work a little bit? 
if you're part of the academy, you got to vote on the awards. Is all I understand. So there's a lot of people on there. So it is kind of being voted by some of it by your peers. There are the people that are in there. So what happens is it's it's a it's a breakdown of all the numbers. So you get these six nominees, and then it gets passed on to these ten people. If they knock one of them off, then it moves on to the next one and the next one. So it is a big process until one gets picked, nominated, and 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 gone for. Right. So it's not just like the academy is one person and it's been like here we'll give it. It's a full body and the breakdown of it is just is bonkers it's no, crazy y- there's a lifetime achievement award uh-huh. for martin scorsese when he's done okay you can have it you you had a lifetime of work it's yours but i think that's cheapening been... martin scorsese as a as a guy that's brought us amazing films thank you for the films but <laughs> if you weren't the best director you don't get the award that's what it defeats the whole purpose of the academy awards if you're just like hey it's your turn i'm gonna give this to you yeah, but I, well, I mean, I can't definitively say that that was the case. A lot of people look at it that way, and that's fine. For me, I don't know. I just like that he got it. I was it, super happy. And, and I'm with you. If it was something yeah. that I really cared about, yeah. I'd be like, hey, you know what? He deserved it, and I'm yeah. biased toward that. But Fair. I've seen it so often, and this is coming back to sports, but in sports awards, they do the same thing all the time, where so-and-so deserves the award, or it's their turn. I'm like, it's not their turn. Right. They were terrible this year. Right. Don't give them that award. And when they do inevitably yeah. give them that award, it destroys any reputation that that award once held because you're now just giving it to people that you think deserve it versus the people that actually earned it for that purpose and it sucks for Cor- Scorsese right. if he never wins a best director award yeah. in the course of his, his career but I can't help that <laughs> I can't well, help that. And I, I can it doesn't understand. make him a worse director. Yeah. I can understand the argument, though, because it is, when you look at it, it's, it's for that year. Yes, it right? is. It says on there, 2007 Oscars. Right. So uh, if you weren't the, in that year, yeah. and you weren't the best, you don't win. By vote, he was the best. It's the worst. Talking about subjectivity. <laughs> That kills me. That stuff kills me. Yeah, and I mean, you can look at it like, again. For me, I was just super happy it happened. I get where you're coming from, but I was just like, that's still awesome that he won it. You I'm obviously so like the guy. I love Scorsese. He's my, I think he's my top director. Yes. When what? it comes to Scorsese, because Goodfellas is my favorite movie of all time. Okay. I can watch that movie all the time, too. Love it. I love pretty much everything Scorsese has done. Especially when he won a, a Best Director. There you um, go. When's the last <laughs> time um, a comedy won... Or has ever won Best Picture. Are you aware of that? Senior Google. I don't remember. Do you? No, I don't remember. I don't remember the I last if... time a, a comedy was actually nominated for a uh, for oh, Best Picture. Well, and now that they're doing not 10. Not a comedy. Uh, Robert uh, Downey Jr. got nominated for Tropic Thunder. Uh, comedy for Oscar best supporting actor? nominations. Comedy Oscar winners. Let's no, see I, want, I want Best Picture. Uh, Critics' Choice. Nope. Oscar winning comedy feature films. The 10 funniest films to be nominated for Best Picture. Now, these were nominated. I don't think anything has ever won. The Full Monty. Goodwill Hunting, not really comedy, as good as it gets. Uh, number 10, Nashville. Robert Altman. Funny Girl, Barbara Streisand. Lost in Translation. That was a good movie. Sofia Coppola. Toy Story 3. It Happened One Night, Fargo. Classic. These are nominated, right? These no, are, I want wins. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for wins. I think it just got nominated. I, I have one for one. you. Go a- for it. According to this, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, 1977 Academy Awards, won for Best Picture. Damn. 77. No respect. No respect. Ago. Before that was 73, 63, 1944, 1938. Pulp Fiction was nominated and should have won, but Forrest Gump won that year. Whoa, whoa nothing beats Forrest Gump. Um, Pulp Fiction beats Forrest Gump. Pulp Fiction is fine. It's just not Annie Forrest Hall Gump. is number one. Pulp Fiction is not just fine. You can't <laughs> sit here and say Pulp Fiction is just fine. I listen to your other podcast. I know that you love Tarantino. I know. Pulp Fiction. I actually watched Pulp Fiction within the past for the first time within the past three years. Did because, it pa- did it hold up for you? Uh, it was cool. And I'm trying to go through this list of like the number like a hundred top one hundred movies of all time, right? Yeah. Because I feel like. If I'm going to be relevant in the world, I need to understand, this comes back to me loving jokes. Yeah. There's a lot of jokes in popular culture that if you don't actually know popular culture or even mainstream culture, you can't get them, right? So I want to read the mm-hmm. most, the top 100 books and then watch the one top 100 movies. And so I yeah, watched yeah. Pulp Fiction hating John Travolta. Well. And he was great. See, and, and John Travolta is a tough one now because you look, you're you're thinking of John Travolta now. Yes. And and you're relating him to a movie that went, that happened, you know, in 94 when it, you know, it was it won 94. Um, I don't have a huge issue. I think he's just a big creep. 
Like, I just think John Travolta is a creepy guy. Um, but yeah, Pulp Fiction is definitely in my top five list. It was cool and and, yeah. and threw me for a loop in some scenes. I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, man. Uh, but There's... an interesting story. Yeah. And not what I expected at all. Yeah. Well, even when you look at Reservoir Dogs, it's another one of my favorites. It's a great movie. The one, one of my favorites that I'm not sure if it holds up today is Fight Club. And I love Fight Club. My big thing for Fight Club was, and if you haven't seen the movie, pause this, but like he... He sh- kills him, or attempts to kill himself at the, at the end. Yeah. Kills the guy that, like, the, the, the dual personality, but he's sure. still alive? So... And I'm what, like, is that different in the book? Uh, I haven't read the book. Okay. Uh, what I got from that was that just the way he shot himself, he didn't actually shoot straight through. Like, it was, like, out the cheek, because the way it looked, his cheek blew out. Sure, but how does he kill the other guy? It For what that is, is finally accepting that he doesn't... Like, he's been saying the entire movie... I'm thankful for everything that you've... Well, not the entire movie, towards the end. I'm thankful for everything that you've done. I'm thankful for everything you've done for me because he was a sad, sad man living in his apartment and buying shit that he doesn't need. All the things that Tyler Durden was preaching against. Finally being brought down to an extreme low level and using fighting as an outlet to break away from the societal norms. It's consumerism, right? It's, it's the, the movie's about consumerism. But at the end, him doing that was him finally saying, I don't need you anymore. So when he did it, he thought he was dead. He didn't know that he didn't actually kill himself. And so all of a sudden, Brad Pitt's character goes, what's that smell? And then he's, and he's finally gone because he didn't need him. When you look at uh, Fight Club, when it first starts out, there are shades. If you pause in certain points, which I have, there are, there are points where Tyler Durden is there. So when he's in the, uh, when he goes to those meetings, yeah. one of those meetings, he's right next to a guy. When he's at the photocopy machine, it flashes, he's there. Hmm. So he, he's, he's brought in slowly, slowly, slowly as our character is dipping further and further into, I guess, normalcy. And so that's when Tyler Durden emerges on the plane. I'm getting an education in movies from you tonight. I hope so. But I still buy. I, I, I consider myself an idiot, so if this helps, that's that's good. Uh, you <laughs> need to redefine the word idiot because <laughs> I call myself an idiot and I make online videos for a living. So yeah, but you make good online videos. I make quality like filming videos, but it doesn't mean like the content is any good. Well, okay, let let's break from Fight Club for a second. You guys, um, for and and for those of you listening right now. Um, you guys have your YouTube channel. Is it Justin and Greg? Justin and Greg, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. YouTube. Um, you guys have started moving, not, not moving, but you've been, been incorporating more comedy in your stuff. I know you guys did that businessman interview, which was hilarious. Uh, or, or every that, other business, every, every other business. Yeah, yeah. And you guys are doing not to, not to call them skits because I think skits demean them. You guys do funny vignettes. You guys do funny videos. You guys do videos that are like, and they're comedy based. And I like them. I appreciate that. And I think they're hilarious because it's in line. Now, my, my, my range for comedy is quite large. I'm not, you know, whatever. Do you guys find it hard to to find to hit that right note on oh, comedy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because the the broader audience you want to appeal to, yeah. the, the broader your jokes have to be. Yeah. Right? And so we did a video the other day, not the other day, a few months ago, where, remember that? clamshell packaging yeah that was impossible to open yeah <laughs> Justin was like this is gonna be so funny and I was like well I feel like it come maybe kind of niche so yeah. we did this video and it, it didn't it didn't hit at all really like it was fine but it didn't it didn't dominate right and it was like oh it's too niche and then we had one they called the winter cycle where I realized my wife is coming home we have a winter's right by our house yeah every single day with more stuff and I would complain and be like wait a minute what are you doing with this? We can't afford this. You're like, oh, I'm taking some of it back. I'm like, and my anxiety level will go down. Yeah. But then I asked Justin and it was the same experience. And I asked a few other, um, and this, you know, like obviously men can do this too, but I asked other husbands and they were like, yeah, that's me. And I'm like, let's make a video about it. Yeah. And of course that video blew up. Winner shared it and it was seen, you know, almost a million times across the country. That video blew up yeah. to, to just, you need to increase your levels. That blew up. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> that blew up. It was awesome. And yeah. like, winners reached out to us and said, hey, we want to share the video. And we're like, ah, okay. Like, yeah. if you want to endorse what we're doing, that's fine. But to me, that was, we found a nerve that made a lot of sense for a lot of people. That yeah. is not easy. Yeah. Right? And that's why I think I have so much respect for Jerry Seinfeld because Jerry Seinfeld did it all the time. Yeah. And I can watch his stuff and his comedy now and I howl because he sees things in a different way. And, and to be a comedian and have the ability to see something and see the humor in it, I think it's, it's such a beautiful skill. 
Yeah. And so for us, yeah, it's it's very hard because um, you want to be funny all the time. Yeah. And, and you're talking about being subjective. And I, I don't care about like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll funny. I want to be smart and funny. And so a lot of that comes back to how do you turn something that's normal and actually like, turn on its head and be funny? And that's... It's hard for me because unless unless I'm in the moment and see it, yeah. I can't manufacture that. Well, and, and and I can imagine that's what it's like. Again, that's why most comedies don't hit. That's why most of Hollywood is worried. Like that's why they were worried about Deadpool giving an R-rated comedy that traditionally doesn't do well at the box office in February, which is January and February used to be the dumping grounds for movies. Mm. So you know, th- I think why comedy hasn't been looked at is because it doesn't have the wide range out of how many movies have you guys or how many videos have you guys made that you'd consider comedy ones 20 uh, 30 yeah let's say let's say 10 to 20 how many of them have aside from the winners one how many of them have struck gold i can uh, say seven or eight for me that for me it was like yes uh i wouldn't even say that many like winners was our, our best video of all time ever yeah and like we've had like the the um that business video did well. And there's a few more that did well. Like we had the, the gold Knights video did well too, but they all do yeah. well for different reasons. They're right. not doing well because they're funny. Yeah. So like, I honestly like three. So, I mean, when you look at that sample size, it's really, it, like that's, that's a small sample size when you're trying to reach a broader audience. We just need, Hollywood needs to have a, a, a director and a writer that are like, we're going to do this and we're yeah. going to do this. Well, yeah, we're going to make funny, videos because I, I watched a uh, game night uh, yeah and there was moments in that where i laughed out loud in the theater that was a funny ass movie yeah like there were some funny things in it and i'm yeah. like this is making me laugh and, and you guys need to know this i grew up on home alone and so home alone to me every christmas i watch home alone one two yeah. i don't care about three and four yeah and but i love slaps of humor yeah you can toss the three shooters in there too if people are getting hurt, not dying, and not injured, just but like hurt. just hurt, yeah. I laugh forever. I used to watch fail compilations on my lunch break. <laughs> thirty minutes for my lunch break, cool. I'm gonna watch a thirty minute fail comp. Yeah. And so I love, I love that kind of humor as well. But like Game Night made me laugh, and when she's cutting his arm, she cuts too much. I'm like, I relate with that. <laughs> I relate with that. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, I like, I just want, I want Jerry Seinfeld to come back. And well, write movies. Yeah, or well, not just make movies. I think people need to pull from that, and that's where the best ones have kind of come from. There, there is that humor, like you said, the sex, drug, and rock and roll humor. I look at as um, uh, far sighted humor, where you look at it from afar, but you can't relate to it. Okay, I can't relate to you know a rock star binging and then yelling at his uh, assistant or something, right. and, and they're having a funny interaction. But the moments like the when when someone mentions the close talker in a Seinfeld, I'm like. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, we I've all been have. There. I've been there. I've been there. So at that point, it's the the nearsighted. It is it is personal. It is, it's a reflection of you, in a way. Yes. I, when sure. when when you're able to build like the winners one, was that is a reflection of millions of people. So I found out. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the biggest thing. We actually did a we did, were doing a video for uh, one of our clients, and we showed up to film it. And this is us like working on the day to day. And the clients were like, hey, you're the winner's guys. And I'm like, yeah, I guess we are the winner's guys. I've never been described as that before. But to me, it was like, oh, my goodness, this video had some reach to it. Oh, yeah. Like, that went across Canada yeah. to be the winner's guys. But, yeah, I'm with you. Like, I just I just need a hero to, to save me in <laughs> in the comedy realm. Because, I mean, I, I, I watch and study comedians yeah. on Netflix, which is it's good for that now. It's like it take, it's taking over HBO. They used to do comedies. Now, now it's Netflix. I like, yeah, they've been they've been pumping out some really good ones. Do you like yeah. Bo Burnham by any chance? Uh, are you 50-50 on him? Uh, I'm probably 50-50. I'm still yeah. like, I'm still getting my list together. Yeah. But if you're talking about, if you're telling me stories that are real. Yeah. Like a John Mulaney. Yeah. I will watch you and I will howl laughing. Yeah. And I, the problem for me is I, I can't manufacture those stories. Like I don't have a, what do you call it? Like his, you know, his most recent one, he had like some detective coming in about street smarts and he described this guy with a mustache and a top hat and a monocle. And <laughs> he was like this PT something or other, some crazy name, Bitten, Bitten Binder was his name. <laughs> Bitten like, binder. It's like Mr. Bookman from Seinfeld, who was the library security guy. Yeah, but like, <laughs> you hear the story, like, there's no way this is real. Then you go yeah. on Twitter, and someone has the VHS of BJ Bittenbinder looking just like John Mulaney described him. And I'm like, oh my goodness, he had these experiences. And so, yeah. 
Uh, John Mulaney, I love. Brian Regan, it makes me laugh. Jim Gaffigan is also funny. Yeah, uh, he, I was surprised that I, I would enjoy him. I never thought I would enjoy him, yeah, but I, like, I enjoy his humor. And, and I mean, he talked about McDonald's once for like nine minutes straight. Yeah. I was like, Jim, this was probably a bit long to talk about this. But I went to see Jerry D. Okay. Uh, here, and I was so disappointed. You were, hey? Yeah, because he, Jerry D, his humor is teacher. He's a teacher humor and, and does like regular teacher stuff that we can all relate with because we sure. all went to grade school. Sure. But his his new stuff, and if you're a community, you always have to try new stuff. His mm. new stuff felt like he was just unsatisfied with his marriage. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. he made two or three or four jokes coming back to like making fun of his wife and telling me how he was unhappy. Yeah. My wife actually booed in the Oh, thing. snap. And we were like front row almost. Britt went was, for the yeah, boo. She's like, boo. And I'm like, wow. yeah, I love you so much. <laughs> You would do that, but uh, yeah, I've always liked Bill Burr for that. He always has kind of weird. I loved his. Uh, he did a he did a four or five minute thing on dogs mm. and how dogs can feel like our our their energy is matching their owner's energy. So he was talking about how his dog's such a psycho because he's a psycho. Right. And I was like, oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and I believe that too. Yeah. Like when I actually meet someone else's like dog, yeah. I'll be like, mm, like what are you telling me about your owner? There's a connection there. Oh, yeah, because my dog used to love to sleep all the time, and I'm like, yep, that's <laughs> me, but I'll nap whenever I can. That's my dog. But, uh, no, I love I love comedy, and I will do my best to try and save it. And, yeah. and if I could find a real comedy that rec- I could recommend to everyone on here, and I can't, uh, at least a new one I can't, I would, um, I'll tell you, when the next time I find a funny one, I will let you know. You should. Or I'll invite you out and just because you like to go to movies, so. So yeah, um, I guess I mean this was just a riff, which I liked. This was fun. We went on. It was a break for you. We went to like everything. We covered a lot. I think we I think we got to the comedy stuff. Eventually. I don't have an answer for you other than yeah. I like what you said. It's subjective, and that's the hardest part. Is that if I watch this, and I'm from India, it's different, obviously. But if I watch it and I'm from in Canada, if I'm from like rural Alberta, it's yeah. different. Like I'm gonna laugh at different things that I'm gonna laugh at, and that yeah. that actually brings me some food for thought because now I'm like hmm. Yeah, I need to find things that are more general and more human. Yeah, because and, and like, and that's where the some of the better comp. Now there is a slapstick, like the Jim Carrey. I've always loved the Jim Carrey, but he's more slapstick. Yes. Um, I also went like again when I talked about the mask and the genie and Deadpool. Because I always bring up pop culture references in my day to day conversations. To make a point about something, I will reference something else. Sure. I will, you know, if. For me, a trigger word is something as simple as someone saying like one line from a movie and then all of a sudden my brain will go to that movie. Can I try one on you? Uh, uh, Sure. I'm not good on the spot, but go for it. How would I give you the finger and you give me my phone call? The Matrix. (laughs) Because I thought that line was something that everyone knew. And after trying that line and failing it time and time and time and time and time again... I finally came to the conclusion, no, it's just me. Like, it yeah. only sticks with me. No one else knows it. So thank you for that. And it's happened to me a couple of times where I'll say some obscure whatever. Uh, obscure, like, I've walked out of the bathroom sometimes and I'd be like, do not go in there. <laughs> Woo! Like, and no one knows No, and, and like, uh, so stuff like, just just stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it's, it's so subjective in that. But, again, I can relate to those in a way because... The way the mask operates is pulling from pop culture and, and doing what he does. The way the genie was is all pop cultures and he's doing uh, Jack Nicholson impressions and I think Eastwood impressions and all that stuff. And he's just using that to, to, to add to his character. Right. Deadpool, the same thing. Yeah. He's referencing one thing to the next. And I'm like, I do this in my day to day with so many people. Some people get it. Some people don't. Mm. And it's like movies, music, whatever I can find. Right. That kind of pulls into my brain and just kind of spits out. But other people, not a big fan of them because they, they don't do that in their day-to-day. Right. Right? So it, that, that's where I think comedy will end up having a resurgence, I think, slowly. I hope so. Just like horror has because horror has had a massive resurgence in the past three to five years. Yes, and I'm thankful for that. And I also think comedy needs to have a resurgence. Like The world is way too serious and way too dark and dire. And, yeah. you know, if you look at social media for sure it's just all negative all the time and i get that people don't like donald trump and that you mm. know the world's going to hell in a ham basket but yeah. like guys we need to be able to detach and have fun and i yeah. i'm part of me blames and i know we were wrapping up but part yeah. of me blames like saturday night live for this where it's like saturday night live mm. you are, you used to be to use your word you used to be like the cultural heartbeat of the zeitgeist for oh, the nation yeah and now all you do is political jabs. And yeah, they're, they're, it's it's like Trump has now become the only thing people can joke about. And it, but at the same time, they joke about it because 
people relate to it because they also don't like Trump. Right, but make a point. Right? I, like, to I, me, it's man, like, I hey, you. Trump, you're dumb. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. guys, we, like, we've we been there. Yeah. But be funny. And, and the best example I've seen of this is Hassan Minaj on Netflix. I'll have to check it out. If you have not watched this, I have never been in a, I've never watched an hour long comedy like this in my entire life <laughs> because he had you. He's a great storyteller. He had you with comedy. Yeah. And then the next moment you were on the verge of tears because he was telling you a, a hard truth oh, in a reality. Man. And I'm like, that is what comedy is supposed to be. Yeah. Where it, it can, it can actually break through barriers and actually teach you something yeah. and challenge you. Yeah. And it has teeth, whereas the comedy we have nowadays is just, it's just lifeless. It's like, hey, I'm going to give you either a cheap laugh or I'm going to make something uh, or take the low-hanging fruit. If you have not watched Hassan Minaj, do not fall asleep while you're listening to this podcast without spending an hour with him. He's, (laughs) it's stunning. It's remarkable in every way. Well, and I'm not a political guy. I don't like getting involved in politics. So for me, a lot of the the comedic landscape now does not work. A lot of comedians are quitting because they can't. A lot of comedians are saying, listen, in today's culture... I actually can't make the jokes I want to make because yeah. people get offended and they and they can't do it. See, and that's why I was a huge fan of Jim Jeffries when he broke out. Like, I went to his show when he was here. I was a huge fan of him because he just does not give an F. But now it seems like he's kind of watered down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you have to. You have to get a lot of sucks. pressure to do that. SNL, I stopped watching when Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan left. Specifically right. when Will Ferrell left. Like, those for me, anything there and earlier. Uh, I watched Delirious, uh, Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Murphy's. And the first 20 minutes, I'm like... This would not play today. Right. People would crucify the guy on the street if this played today. Yeah, it's tough. It's crazy. It's tough because comedy needs, you need to have grace with comedy. Sure. And it's a dance. It needs to be, it's supposed to be, um, have a point. Yes. And I think that a lot of comedy now it just doesn't have a point other than like, hey, don't vote for so and so or so and so. It's yeah. dumb. Yeah. Whereas, uh, yeah, there's, there's people that are leaders and, Again, Hassan Minaj will impact you when you watch it. Yeah. Because he's one, he's brilliantly funny. Yeah. But two, he knows how to make a, make a point. And I, if Saturday Night Live can figure out how to come back and actually make a statement without being one so obvious and two yeah. so polarizing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they might have something. And and it's kind of like where you watch people that they just sit and complain about again politics. So for them, it's like, well, everyone, our audience is very old now. I don't know how many young kids are watching Saturday Night Live to be honest. Um, so for them, it's like our audience has grown up with us. Most of them are, you know, 35, 40, 50, maybe 60 years old, whatever they are. And they're sitting and watching the news all day. So when we're making comedy jabs at it, they think they're a part of that joke. Sure, they're, it's for old people. And someone made the comment, Saturday Night Live is for journalists now. And I was like, yeah, it totally yeah. is. Like you're, yeah. you're speaking almost to yourself. Yeah. And be like, haha, it's funny. And you'll always have this cultural relevance, at least for the next yeah. Uh, foreseeable future yep but it's going away yeah and that goes back to the Zoolander 2s the Anchorman 2s they're, it's like they're just talking to themselves it, it's like they're 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 saying inside jokes now that I'm no longer a part of mm. and it's not funny to me anymore right and and again that's where it was so heartbreaking and milking one thing that they continued on to do and Deadpool almost did that a couple times but they were able to find a way to flip it and, but again, a lot of those comedies, the comedy has to evolve. Yes. And so when the comedy doesn't evolve or you lose sight of what your initial thing was, i.e. Um, Zoolander being a satire, you've lost it altogether. Yes. And stop taking jabs like, hey, remember when I made this joke? Because if I say a joke back to back, first time it might be funny. Second time it's like, you literally just said that joke. But true story, if you say the same joke seven times, it's funny again the seventh time. It is? Yes. Are you saying that for me to try it? Yeah, try it. I'll try try it. try it throughout your day. If you make the same joke to the same person seven times throughout the same day, it's it's funny, yeah. kind of funny, yeah. not funny, definitely not funny. <laughs> okay, it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. And then it's like on the sixth time, it's like mm, it's kind of funny again. And then sometimes you're funny again. That sounds like a road trip where you're super excited on a road trip, and then you hit those ebbs and flows. Yes. All of a sudden, you get to a point where you're just like, I need to like That's I need to is. get here. And then all of a sudden, it's just like. Tony Braxton hits in, and then you're just singing "Unbreak My Heart" to the top of your lungs on that seventh goal. You love Tony Braxton. I love Tony Braxton. Are you a, a Monica or a, a Brandy person? Oh, that this boy is mine. Remember that song? Oh, oh yeah. You're right. Uh, I'm gonna go Brandy. Really? Yeah. I was Monica till I died. You were, hey? Oh yeah. That's fair. I, funny thing is, I don't actually know what else she sung. Neither. I just know her from that song. I'm just remembering her singing, and I remember the music video right now, and I'm right. like. 
Yeah, I remember. I'm Brandy. But again, I think a lot of it has to do with I don't remember Monica that well. Yeah, Brandy and I never got along, so. Well, we've reached the hour 36 mark. Uh, obviously, some of us, well, we'll cut some of this stuff. Um, and I'm going to cut that part out, too. Um, but yeah, this was actually just me and Greg riffing about, we started with comedy. We went to some TV stuff. We kind of brought it back to comedy. Maybe, yeah. It was fun just like, and, to hear you out and, and learn what movies you liked. And there was some horror in there. And yeah. there was some directors. And I actually, the next time we do this, I have way more to go off of. Because I actually can see your strengths now and go, oh, okay. okay. You really know superheroes. You know directors. You know like themes in movies. And now I can come. To point those out. Yeah, I can come with stuff and be like, wait a minute. Juan, explain <laughs> this to me. I disagree with you here. Yeah. You've got some things to learn about uh, what it requires to win an actual award yeah. versus, being, okay. versus being given okay, a free okay, award. Okay, and okay, okay, okay. We can do that next time. So, <laughs> Man, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. Fun. Thanks for uh, I need you to plug whatever you want to plug. Go for uh, it. Hey, the only thing I do for a living right now is it's called Justin and Greg. So if you're bored, you can check it out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. We do content stuff. We have a lot of fun. Our tagline is we don't take ourselves too seriously, so neither should you. And uh, my goal is to just try and make the world a better place one laugh at a time. So awesome. Uh, for those of you uh, listening right now, thank you once again. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the F words G. You can email us at the F word podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you're following entertain facts on Instagram. And until next time, I'm G and I'm out.